Well, let's review what we have uh, last looked at in Nehemiah, the last chapter, which was, well, a busy month for the Israelites. Uh, we saw the people of Israel celebrated the Feast of Trumpets when they called upon Ezra to, to read from the book of the law, and he did so while the people stood attentively for, get this, five to six hours. Wow. The people were obviously burdened, grieved, uh, not by the length of the service, by the way, but by their sin. The leadership then encouraged them that this was not the time to grieve, but to rejoice. And on the second day, the heads of the fathers of the houses gathered with Ezra, the priests, the Levites, to study the law. And it was here that they realized their need to obey God's word and celebrate the Feast of the Booths, which had been overlooked to this point in time, and immediately set out for making announcements uh, throughout the land to, to all of Jerusalem to come and, and build booths. And the people came and they celebrated and with great rejoicing for a week, which concluded with solemn assembly. Turn with me in your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 9. And we're just going to read the first uh, five verses here, and then I'll open in a word of prayer. Now on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. And the Israelites separated themselves from all, the, all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the in iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place, and they read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. For another quarter of it they made confession, worship the Lord their God. On the stairs of the Levites stood Jeshua, Bani, Cadmiel, Shebaniah, Bani, Sherebiah, Bani, and Sheraniah. And they cried with a loud voice to the Lord their God, then the Levites, Jeshua, Cadmiel, Bani, Hashan, Habani, Sherebiah, Hodiah, Shebaniah, Pathaniah, said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all, blessed and praise. Let's open in a word of prayer here. Let's pray. Father, we cry out to you here this morning that we might uh, hear your voice through your word from Nehemiah, that we might be your people for your glory. Father, help us to set our minds on things of, of the spirit and not on what our flesh desires. May we walk worthy of your calling. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Have you ever gotten so dirty, so incredibly muddy that you couldn't wait to get hosed down or jump in a hot shower to wash off? <laughs> Over the years I've done Plenty of uh, different activities, gun quadding, biking, etc., with friends, and I've gotten dirty. I've gotten muddy, grubby, slimy, you name it. But never as much as when I was around 10 years old. I, can't, I don't know exactly how old I was, but I do remember that it was kind of a church function or a gathering of a bunch of friends from church at a friend's place where all the kids got into a big mud pit and uh, we wrestled for hours. <laughs> I had uh, mud plastered all over me, uh, even in my hair. <laughs> if you can imagine that, right? I think my pictures have, uh, my, sorry, my parents have pictures of it. And uh, yes, 
pictures of me with hair. <laughs> it was quite an event. Um, like the picture of mud plastered on me, my friends, people get dirty. Nations get a layer of filth on them by practicing, by tolerating terrible injustice and, and sinful behavior. And it takes great effort to remove. Sometimes the change that is needed isn't about dirt or mud or the slime, but about sin. Let me ask you this. Have you taken the necessary steps to cleanse yourself from sin? This morning we want to look at what happens when hearts are cleansed and guilt is released. We see here that Israel has just finished the second of two celebrations found in Leviticus. Uh, the people then lingered for a few more days to, to hear more of God's word. Feasting had turned to fasting as the word brought conviction once again and people started confessing their sins. Learning how to confess sin is a concept we don't enjoy talking about, right? Even as Christians, our lips are often sealed. And I've seen this play out often uh, numerous times within our church. Most of us like to remain silent about our struggles or our pains. And at times, this is our go-to, to remain silent. Because, well, sharing our sin, even with our closest friends or families, makes us more vulnerable than we would want to be. Speaking on vulnerability, let me share you this. Four, pe four preachers met for a friendly gathering. And during their conversation, one preacher said to the others, Our people come to us and pour out their hearts. They confess certain sins and needs why don't we do the same here together confession is good for the soul well in due time all agreed and one confessed that he liked to go to movies and he would sneak off from the church second confessed to liking to smoke cigars and the third one confessed to playing cards when it came to the fourth one well, he wouldn't confess. The others continued to press him, saying, Come on now, we confessed ours. What is your secret? What is your vice? Finally, he answered, It's gossiping, and I can hardly wait to get out of here. <laughs> what is an area that you struggle with, right? What's an area that needs to be confessed in our lives? And are we, unlike this pastor illustration, are we working on overcoming it? Confession of sin is the admission of what we did in the agreement with God that our actions or words were wrong. In the court of law, a person who confesses to a crime is agreeing that he or she, in fact, violate a social standard, violated a social standard. When we confess our sins, we're admitting that we violated God's law. We admit that we chose to do, say, think something opposed to God's will, and we stand guilty before him. Confession without repentance is only words. Like last week, we saw that we need to be doers of the word. John the Baptist counseled his he hearers to not merely confess their sins, but demonstrate by their actions that they need to truly repent of them. Right? Right? Like our pastor illustration, have we put the old life behind us or are we still holding tightly to it, embracing it, allowing it to grow? For instance, when we first come to Christ, 
We begin the Christian life through repentance and faith. We see that in Acts chapter 11, verse 18. We acknowledge Jesus as Lord, Romans 10, 9. The initial submission to Christ necessarily entails confession of sin against him. This is our initial conversion. The Holy Spirit is, of course, at work in all of this, making us anew, transforming us from the inside out and setting us on a new course. And so if we have not repented of our sins, we have not truly believed in Jesus Christ in a saving way. Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 to 7 instructs us, Therefore, as, we, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Since we received him through repentance and faith, we should then, right, walk in repentance and faith. And that is what we see here in chapter 9 of Nehemiah. Verse 1 says, Now on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. Two days after the feast concluded, the people are gathered again, preparing this time with fasting, sackcloth, and dirt on themselves to express grief over their sins. This chapter here, along with Ezra chapter 9, uh, you can even look at Daniel chapter 9, are one of the greatest prayer confessions in the Bible. And uh, we'll get to that uh, later in the weeks following. It's full of, of rich instruction about who God is, and what he's done for his people, what his people must do for him. It teaches us that... Uh, because we are prone to sin, because God is so rich in mercy, ongoing repentance should mark our lives. I won't go into too much detail, but Ezra has just learned um, in this chapter of chapter 9, if we look at it, uh, the enormous sin of Israel, has, which has defiled the community as a whole. And Ezra comes to God in, in verses 6 and 10 to 11, and weeping and confessing the sins of the people while praying. And as he prays, others join in him with him, crying and confessing their sins. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from, the, from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. As we look at this verse, as we look at this passage, other supporting verses uh, passages we need we need to understand that the people here were treating their understanding of their sin in the same way that they would treat the loss of a loved one by fasting putting on us putting on sackcloth dirt in their hair when we look at those three things fasting they came on empty stomachs the feasting was now over, and every time that their stomachs growled like ours today, looking forward to potluck, right? The fasting would remind them that they were there for confessing their sins. The sackcloth. This is here to remind them, uh, and to, and has to do with discomfort. The fabric against their bare skin would be itchy. It would be unpleasant. And so every time that they felt the need to change those clothes, it would remind them of their confession of sin. Need to confess sin. The earth on their heads or the dirt on their hair was, was putting, obviously, dirt in their hair. Not like mine, but it, it was uncomfortable. It would have made their hair naughty, clumpy, dirty. You would have wanted to wash it out unless you had, obviously, a bald head like myself where it would simply kind of fall off or maybe it would just darken my scalp a bit. Dust, dirt. 
This action was to emphasize the sorrowful component of repentance, an expression of their self-humiliation. Romans chapter 13, verse 14 says, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. That is a wow verse right there. The image Paul uses to describe this, this, that pro process is taking off, putting on clothing, which is symbolic to, to thoughts and behavior, right? When someone is truly convicted of sin, their flesh is brought into submission. And the sackcloth, the earth, or dirt shows this. Verse 2 says, And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. Over in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33 says, Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. If you go back to the Old Testament, this time to, to Leviticus chapter 20, verse 26 for a moment, you can read along. And it, it helps us here to understand why they separated themselves. Leviticus 20, verse 26 says, You shall be holy to me. For I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. God is giving all this instruction here to those who are his people, to mark them out as different from those people around them so that they would then purify themselves. But as we see in scriptural, Scripture in several places, in the Old and the New, Israel ignored this separation. They partnered with their, their neighbors in compromising ways. We see that in Deuteronomy 7, verse 3 which then they then became idolatrous themselves. We see that in Ezra chapter 6, verse 21. Separation was, was necessary in those cases, and we see the same principle in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 to 18. Remember, I had mentioned something similar to this last week, and I brought out 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. And Peter applied those words to Christian believers in the church today. And it says this, 1 Peter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Again, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6, 14 to 16, says something similar to this. It says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So the application is, is simply this. If you're in Christ today, you are different, radically different. And our actions and our words should show it. And we also notice here in verse 2 of, of chapter 9 of Nehemiah, a transition from preparing for, for confession to practicing it. Having prepared themselves to repent, they stood, they confessed their sins to the Lord. It wasn't simply their personal sins, but even the sins of their fathers before them. James chapter 5 verse 16 reminds us to, to confess our sins with others, which says, which says this, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Question is, like we started at the beginning. Do we confess our sins with others? Do we have accountability? Who are we accountable to? Is there a close friend who encourages you, but also can rebuke you if you're wrong? And if we're truly honest, none of us has, well, 
arrived at a place in our sanctification where we no longer need accountability. And I find that many Christians are often convinced that they don't have much to confess. But those who are truly convicted have no trouble at all providing the Lord with a laundry list, list of ways that they have failed, fallen short. And when they run out, they'll confess the sins of those before them, their nation, etc. When I was thinking about this, Job came to mind. And he was like this. When his children would feast together, he would, in Job chapter 1, verse 5, send and consecrate them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. And so we see here in these first two verses how they dressed, revealed their hearts. Where they stood made clear in their allegiance. And thirdly, what they said revealed their need. What was their need? The law, the word of God. Verse 3 says, And they stood up in their place, and they read from the book of the law, their God for a quarter of the day for another quarter of it they made confession and worshiped the Lord their God one of the things that stands out to me right from the start was that the people could not get enough of God's word Remember just last week, looking at, at chapter 8, we saw them devote a serious amount of time having Ezra read to them from God's word. Six hours worth. Standing no less, right? A typical Jew, as we, as we look at the day, how this came about, a typical Jewish day was made up of 12 hours. That's, that's daylight hours, basically. And so if we break that down into quarters, three, six, nine, twelve, right? We have three hours spent on reading and listening to the law. And another three was confessing and worshiping God. That's half the daylight hours. That's another six-hour service, right? <laughs> do, we, do we need to start doing sick? No, I'm just kidding. Verses 4 and 5 says this, On the stairs of the Levites stood Jeshua, Bani, Cadmiel, Shebaniah, Bunny, Sherebiah, Bani, Sharaniah. And they cried with a loud voice to the Lord their God. Then the Levites, Jeshua, Cadmiel, Bani, Hashabaniah, Sherebaniah, Hoadiah, Shebaniah, Pethahiah, said, Stand up. Bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. In the New Testament here, we're told to confess our sins to one another. I, I read this earlier. James chapter 5, verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. Confession and sin, co confession of sin and worship go together. It's not a response of worship, but an element of it. This is not something that happens secretly or in private, but with people getting together and confessing sin publicly for all to hear. This is corporate confession. People confessing sin before God. This is out loud, right? Audible. Psalm 66, verses 17, 20 says, I cried to him with my mouth, and high praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly, God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me 
This is what they were doing, gathering, talking in a loud voice. We saw it back in Ezra chapter 9. Their confession is a prayer to God. And after all, what a prayer. What is prayer but communicating with our Heavenly Father, right? We bring that into our everyday lives. What is key to a successful marriage? Communication, right? We hear that often. Why? Because at the heart of any relationship is communication. You speak, I listen. I speak, you listen. You reveal yourself to me, I reveal myself to you. We get to know one another. Love grows through intimacy, connection, right? And marriage, right? Likewise, prayer is essential if we want to have a fruitful relationship with God. Prayer. Oh, no. Not that word. Often, right, we don't want to pray. It's always put to the last resort. We may say something like, do I have to pray? And to that I would say, no. No. You get to pray, right? This is a privilege that we have as Christians to speak to the creator of all things. El Eloah, right? Elohim, El Shaddai, El Shaddai, Adonai, Yahweh. These are just a few names that we can use to speak to our Father in heaven. They're found in scripture. There's many more, right? And these all give their character, characteristics, give him all the praise, adoration, glory, honor. That's what we do when we come before God in prayer. It's to give him all the praise, adoration, glory, honor. And like I said last week, I mentioned that we need to lather. We need to rinse, repeat, right? Well, we need to devote ourselves to reading and sitting under the preaching of the word. Yes, that's very important. But we also need to spend an equal time uh, and an equal amount of time in prayer, confession, praise, to maintain a, a proper balance between head knowledge, right? And heart knowledge, heart application. Those two are very important. I'll close with this. In his classic book, Life Together, Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes this. He who is alone with his sin is utterly alone. Even in the bursting congregation, a lack of confession means a lack of community. In fear of admitting to others that sin, sins beset us, Bonhoeffer says, we remain alone with our sin, living in lies and hypocrisy. The fact is that we are sinners. And without acknowledging this, people will either unwilling, will be either unwilling or unable to truly reach out to others, thereby missing out on one of the blessings of belonging to the church in the first place, bearing one another's burdens. Bonhoeffer's lament is that worshipers can be unwilling to come to terms with who they really are. We are sinners, but in Christ Jesus, we are something much more. Sinners saved by grace. The weekly rhythms of worship, including these elements of, of repentance and restoration, are vital in impressing on our hearts the gospel identity. And it's an identity that belongs to the church as a corporate body. Public worship causes us to look outside of ourselves and remember that Jesus came to save his people from their sins. While we are on earth, that salvation is not complete in one sense, right? The church 
is still a work in progress. So she must pray. For now, as we gather as Christians, we must gather as confessors as well. Forgive us our debts is the call of the faithful community. And what a wonderful thing to hear Christ's beautiful promise in response in 1 John chapter 1, 9, which says this, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the one and only true God. And we come before you in need of spiritual awakening, like what we have read here in Nehemiah. Please cause us, teach us, lead us to worship you and confess of our sins, to be cleansed of all of our our filthiness. Father, may your word lead us to full obedience. May we delight in your will and walk in your ways. We pray for this in our day and in, in our lives and in our churches. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless.